Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm honored to be here uh, and sharing with you uh, the experiences we have from Norway with establishing a digital library, as we call it, a national library for the 21st century. And thank you so much, uh, Paul Klimpel, for inviting me to this uh, important event. Um, this morning, I will be telling you about how we have established the digital library. And I'll give you an overall view on how we are thinking about this, and I'll go into more details about some parts, especially when it comes to the bookshelf, as Paul also mentioned a project where we give access to all books published in Norway up to the year 2001, freely on the internet. So, let's start with uh, telling you a little about our institution. The Norwegian National Library is located in Oslo and in Muirana. Muirana is a small industrial city, 1,000 kilometers north of Oslo. And, and the National Library came uh, to Numuirana as part of an industrial restructuring process, actually. So it was um, some kind of accidental happening. Um, altogether, we are a staff of 450 people, and there's 200 in Muirana, and there's 200 in Oslo. In Muirana, we have all the, um, what we call the production where we have the acquisition and the cataloging, where we have all the digitization uh, and development of the digital library, and where we have the long-term preservation within the mountain walls. In Oslo, we have, uh, of course, the reading rooms, the exhibitions, and the conferences and events. Um, then I'll show you... Uh, no, sorry. a short video uh, on how we work when we digitize. Because for us, it's important that if we are really creating a digital library, this is about volume. You have to have volume. If you don't have volume, it will not be a relevant uh, uh, amount of information for serious research and serious use. So for us, it has been important to digitize the whole collection and not specific parts, chosen books, chosen objects, which, of course, for some purposes can be interesting. But for a national library to be relevant is to have all the content digitized. So uh, at the first, uh, you saw the, the conveyor belt with uh, bringing the books from the shelves to be digitized. And here we have this, uh, this digitizing machinery. Uh, we started this operation in 2000 Four, with a statement saying that we should be the core of a Norwegian digital library. And we had a follow-up in 2006 where we said we will digitize all of our collections. And we were trying to, to gain experiences from the Google book projects. But because at that time we had some contacts with the Michigan uh, University Library, which was one of the first Google libraries. So we went there to see, but we didn't get inside the Google venue, of course, but we, <laughs> we spoke to the library, so we knew how they operated. So, and here you see uh, there's the newspaper operation. Uh, but I have to say that most of the newspapers are being digitized from microfilm. And we do that in India and not up north in Norway. Um, with all the text material we digitize, we of course do the OCR treatment so we can be searched uh, with the full text uh, to, to, uh, to find access. Uh, here are some of the, the, the photo digitization. And we, of course, digitize film, which we have been doing for a while, but only more recently are scaling up. This is the celebration in 1945, after the war in the, the main street in Oslo. Uh, and as I'll tell you more about later, we have a long-lasting cooperation with the Norwegian broadcasting company uh, where we actually share a common uh, uh, archive. 
and this is more, you know, specific purposes. But we have a lot, have a lot of wax rolls as well. And this is an Inuit song from Greenland. <laughs> And of course, this adds up to a huge digital archive, which is growing very fast. And uh, for the moment, we have uh, a content of 6,000 terabytes of unique material, which we, for safety purposes, conserve in three copies. So it's altogether 18,000 terabytes of content. Well, just to give you a view on how we think about uh, this operation. The foundation of uh, the National Library in Norway is, of course, the Legal Deposit Act. Uh, we had a very modern Legal Deposit Act back in 1989, also including what was then called digital documents. That was, of course, before the internet. It was more like CD-ROMs and stuff like that. But it, it also included this. So, we get all the printed material. We have all the music, both the sheet music and the music itself. We have all the broadcasting. We have all the film and all the video, and all the photographs and the digital documents, and we also harvest the NO, .no domain. So it means that in Norway, there is one institution taking care of all this, uh, while you, in, in most countries, you have separate institutions, like sonar archives and broadcasting archives. But then, of course, Norway is a smaller country compared to, for example, Germany, which is much bigger. Well, just some, uh, some key figures. Um, we, we have a special purposely built building up in Wirana, which is actually a digitization fabric uh, or a factory where we uh, have lots of, uh, of, of equipment where we do this. So to, to our digital strategy, uh, we have three main part of this strategy. The first one is, as I told you, to systematically and with less, the less possible less cost to digitize all the content uh, we have from, from A to Z. Uh, we do this, but of course we also do digitization on demand for special purposes, like when we have a uh, we celebrate authors, we, we do digitize their specific collections. Or as this year, when we have had the bicentennial of the Norwegian constitution, we have done a lot of digitization in cooperation with the parliament and the parliamentary archives. Uh, and then we try to have a digital deposit of born digital mat material. Because these days, most material, even if it's published on paper, it's born digital. So there are digital copies. So we try to have agreements uh, with the uh, publishers to, to get their digital files, and not only the books. That saves us a lot of money, and a lot of effort, of course, because then we don't have to, to re-digitize it. Uh, and these days, all the broadcasting is digital, so we get all the broadcasting being um, uh, uh, published uh, on file, on the file format every night. They just feed into our digital repository. And the same is for film, because the Norwegian film industry has been digitized. So these days, there's no analog film circulating anymore. It's only digital. And we try to get arrangement with the newspapers to have their print files, digital print files, so we don't have to digitize them once more. We had agreements with some of the publishers as well to have their print files for books. Uh, but it hasn't been a, not quite so successful, although we have some of the smaller publishers uh, giving us the print files. And the third, and I think this is the most important, important part of our strategy, is that we try to establish uh, what we call strategic partnership with publishers. Uh, in political terms, that would be called public-private partnership. We don't normally use this term, but it's, it's the same. Where we have, um, uh, we make, the, uh, we go into partnerships where they pay some of it and we pay some of it and we m make joint operations uh, to, to, uh, to achieve our common goals. 
The longest lasting uh, partnership is with the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. It has been running for uh, almost 14 years when we started to digitize their historical radio archive collection. And we have a lot of uh, agreements with different newspapers and uh, news publishers as well. And other owners of collections, of course, uh, which could be private institutions, smaller institutions, municipal institutions. Uh, if we search on the, um, an open search, uh, we'll, we'll get a list like, like this. This is small letters in its Norwegian, so I'll translate some of it for you. Um, uh, we see an open search say that you can access 366,000 books in full text. Uh, you can reach uh, 685,000 newspaper volumes, and you can hit, uh, you find 1.2 million radio programs uh, searchable. Uh, this is, of course, if you do the search in-house. And this is, of course, a question of, uh, of rights. If you do the search uh, online from anywhere in, in Norway, you will get another list. Uh, and then the numbers will drop, uh, mainly for the, the radio archives, because the broadcasting company doesn't have the right to publish uh, their uh, historical archives except from certain specific parts. And I'll return to, to the numbers uh, and tell you more about it a, a little later. Um, and then to the, this, what we call the service level, the functionality. With all text, we can do the full text search because we do optical character recognition with all the stuff we digitize and put on the net. You can search a single word or you can search by phrase. You can do a multimedia search. You can search the whole library. And you can do a specialized search for each media because for some research purposes, some researchers like to, do, to use other parameters than the more Google-like free text search. And you, uh, we are, uh, have entrances for that as well. We have, of course, bibliographics and thematic access to certain material. For instance, when we, when we celebrate authors, we, we do a bibliography of that specific author. In 2011, we had this polar year and we made a bibliography for the polar uh, explorers and, and, and stuff like that. The Norwegian National Library is also a language bank, the Norwegian language bank, which means that we, are, uh, we, have, we have all the words and we also uh, have a, uh, this language bank for research use and for uh, commercial use as well, like uh, translating programs for PCs and uh, stuff like that. And we also now are establishing the Ngram search, and I'll show you a bit later about that. And then I'll tell you so of some of the digital services uh, we have. We have the bookshelf, which I have already mentioned and will return to. We have these historical newspapers. Uh, and this uh, access is in all the Norwegian libraries. That was how far we were able to get when we negotiated with the, publish uh, the newspaper publishers. Of course, we would like to give it freely for everyone, but we wasn't able to, to, to do that. But uh, if, if you're near uh, a library, whether it's a public library or it's a research library, you can access the historical archives as well. Uh, and then we have the historical archive of the Norwegian Broadcasting Company. Uh, for the moment, uh, there are 40,000 programs freely available for everyone to, to search in the time span from 1933 and up till today. Uh, in this year, we have been making this, this uh, mini portal called the government. And we have digitized all the parliamentary proceedings from the Norwegian government uh, from 1914 and up till today, which was uh, two and a half million pages of, of uh, stenographic uh, <laughs> uh, reference from, from all the uh, proceedings. We have a service called uh, Norway Sitting from Dia, uh, and we have this language bank. So to the bookshelf, uh, if I search by, I, 
as I'm in Berlin now, I try to search for Berlin, see what you can find about Berlin in, in a bookshelf. If I do a search for Berlin, I'll find uh, this list. And I see that in 60,000, uh, Berlin is mentioned 60,000 times in Norwegian books. It's mentioned almost 400,000 times in Norwegian newspapers and even in 2,700 radio programs. So there's quite a lot of stuff about uh, Berlin in our digital library. If, uh, if we um, arranged a search, uh, the, the, the list by, uh, by year and have the, the latest first, and then you can see that the top book here is from 2013. This is a book you can access at the National Library, but not online because online it's 2001, which is the limit. But uh, it's digitized, and it, uh, if you're on the premises, you can, you can read it. If we turn it the other way around, we see the, late, the first book where we find Berlin is from 1501. And this, of course, you can have everywhere. <laughs> and when you open the book, you can read it. Uh, it's, it's in two different formats. It's HTML and it's flash-based reading. So you can just read it like this and turn pages. Uh, this is a, a, a travel book about Berlin. So let's show you a bit of the newspapers. We search for Berlin in newspapers and see the, the latest mentioning of Berlin is from September in a local newspaper. In, uh, it, this is a remote part of Norway. It's a very local one. Norway has a, it's a special newspaper country because we have 250 different uh, newspapers within a quite small country, but there's lots of valleys and mountains, so they have their own newspapers in every valley. And, and uh, the agreements with the newspapers is like that we put online uh, their historical archive, and then we were wondering how, how recent uh, would it be uh, possible to, to give access. So up to the last week we give access. So we said, if a newspaper is more than one week, it's accessible. Um, and if you turn the other way around here and, and uh, have the oldest newspaper, we see that we have a mentioning of Berlin in newspapers from the 18th century. And you can, if, if you search by word, you can, you can find like here, you, you get a mark on Berlin, and, like you used to do in, in searching. Uh, then to the radio archive, and as I told you, we have 2,700 programs mentioning Berlin. And searching the radio archive, I found a very interesting program, which I'll start in just a second. This is, I've, I've been told, the first uh, broadcasting, German broadcasting, whatever, from 1923. So I, I didn't know it, it was in our library. I just searched for Berlin and it came up. <laughs> Very joyful. So probably it has been broadcasted in Norway at some time. I don't know when. Um, then to the government site, which uh, I told you about, uh, where we can have the proceedings. And, and this is very interesting service. Both it is made in cooperation with researchers from the university in Bergen. But it's also a very popular thing to search in, because if you have a great grandfather or a great-grandfather, or an uncle, or aunt, something, being a representative at the parliament. You could search her up by name, and, and you can find every word they ever told in the parliament. And you can check whether the stories they tell you is really true or not. Uh, yeah, this is like, uh, if you search for Berlin, there's lots of mentioning of Berlin, of course, in, in um, public uh, papers and, 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 um, and in the proceedings. And then to Norway, seen from the air. This is a cooperation we do with all 
Norwegian municipalities. There are 425 different local municipalities in Norway. And this is archived, the municipalities bought from a company uh, taking pictures from the air in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, the pictures has been in the basements of the municipalities. They haven't been able to, to use it for some uh, specific purposes. And we have an agreement saying that if they send us the collection and give us the right to publish, we will digitize and put it up on the air uh, in a service where they can uh, uh, find it uh, and access it from the air. And here we combine uh, information, ge geographical information with the Norwegian Mapping Society and, uh, and um, uh, Google Maps to, to make a graphical or geographical entrance point. And when you start searching in the pictures, you can find it start popping up on the screen like this. And here you can see a, a typical uh, North Norwegian on the coastline society. And uh, uh, the pictures are scalable. By scaling on the mouse, you can, you can enlarge them. And you can even see the, the people on the picture. So this is being open now for, for, uh, for the audience to put in their own information. So they can, they can even write who lived in that house at that time. And uh, you have to watch this one, for, of course, for uh, privacy reasons. But it, it's a, I think it will become a very, very popular service. We have just a beta version going on now, and it's uh, being developed. And then we have this, um, what I call the, the upcoming services. This is the Engram search. Uh, and this is a, this is a graphical uh, you know, presentation of the Deutsche Wirtschaftswunder. Because here you see the mentioning in Norwegian literature of four different uh, um, car brands. There's the Audi, the BMW. There's two, there are French uh, cars like the, it's, uh, the Renault, and they have this American car, Chevrolet. And you can see uh, the Audi and the BMW was on the bottom in 1949. In, in 1985, the BMW especially took off, and it's now, if you look through the literature, the most popular car. <laughs> or spoken about, written about car. Uh, here's another, uh, the frequency of the, uh, the word uh, Berlin, West Germany, and East Germany. And there's, at the bottom, there's a timeline from 1920 and up until today. And you can see the blue line is Berlin, and Berlin has uh, decreased over the years. But you can, you can spot the, uh, when the wall came down, uh, because then it flattens out. Uh, and you can see the, the, the use of East uh, Germany, which is the yellow line, which are now most, uh, much, uh, less frequent than it used to be in the uh, 60s. Well, as the numbers of uh, objects uh, coming uh, to, the, to the internet grows, the, the numbers of visitors grows as well. And these are the, the five last years, and the yellow line at the top showing that uh, in last month we had 400,000 visits to the, uh, the digital library, which has to be compared to the fact that in Norway we have only 5 million inhabitants. So, uh, but this tells us that we are a digital library. We have 200,000 visits at the premises a year, and we have 400,000 visitors a month at the digital uh, library. And here's the visits uh, to the book killer, to the books, and you can see that. Uh, I have been speaking, speaking about the strategic uh, partnership and uh, the, the synergies uh, uh, with the cooperation. So uh, I have one minute left, so I'll I'll go f fast through these uh, next uh, pictures. The contract for the bookshelf is that it contains all books published in Norway up to the year 2001. It's 250,000 titles. They're full text searchable. They download it uh, as PDFs if they're in public domain. And they're accessible only for Norwegian IP addresses. We couldn't get it freely everywhere, which we would like to. But uh, this is a start. 
Um, there's limited access for foreign use. You can actually, from some places uh, here in Berlin, even uh, uh, search those, uh, those books. The rights holders have a right to withdraw works. And up till today, there has been withdrawn 4,000 titles of the uh, 250,000, which is not much. Uh, compared to that there are still four and a half thousand titles accessible on the internet, which is in commercial circulation as well. So this coexists uh, side by side. The contract uh, says that we pay an annual remuneration per page. Uh, if you compare that to, to uh, translate it to uh, Eurocent, we pay 0 0.04 Eurocent per page put available on the net. In 2007, when all the books are accessible, that will be a, a month of 0.34 euro per inhabitant per year to have this access, which is not a lot of money. But of course, it's a lot of money for the, the right holders, because these are money that wouldn't get to them uh, if not this project wasn't existing. So, of course, for the National Library, this is core activity. It's a public mission to give access to the cultural heritage. It's a question of language polity, because uh, Norwegian languages is a very small language, and we are flown over by mainly English-speaking content on the net. For the right shoulders, this is uh, eternal life for their books. It's, uh, they can have access, free access to the high-quality files. Uh, if they want, we will give it to them. And it's an uh, additional source of income. And this is, the, this is a, a commercial long tail uh, project, you could also call it, because uh, uh, they were, there would not be any money circulating with the, with the long tail, if not. And the reason why we're able to do this is because we have this legal agreement called the Extended Collective Licensing. The Kopinor, the Collecting Society, uh, which is approved of by the government to represent uh, all the right shoulders. And they can negotiate agreements, binding agreements, both for members and non-members, and also for foreign right holders. So this makes it easier for us to negotiate the rights because we don't have to make individual arrangements. We can do it with one party. And Copenor, uh, they collect and distribute the compensation among the right shoulders. Uh, the publishers, the authors, and uh, other right holders, uh, illustrators, and whatever. And they also, as I said, uh, also distribute money for non-members and for foreign uh, right holders. Uh, we have been looking into who is who's using the service, and mainly, in, in the, and this is in the beginning, because this, this was a poll taken two years ago. So it was mainly students and staff at universities and colleges that was using the service, of course. And the search uh, we saw was for specific books, uh, like curriculum, but also uh, books about uh, hobbies. You know, all over Europe there is a knitting wave going on. And we have known this for three years because uh, all the knitting books came on the top of the list uh, two years ago. And, uh, So, and this is important for, for the publisher, of course. Does this have any effect on book sales? What we saw from, uh, from the, the survey we did was that it both promotes and substitutes books. There was 11% saying they had dropped buying the book because they found it on the net. And there was 11% saying they went to buy the book because they found it on the net. They, they didn't knew it existed before. So this equals. Uh, when it comes to libraries, there is a slight uh, you know, uh, overweight of, uh, of substitution. But it's not statistically, uh, you know, um, yeah. We can't prove it. We cannot prove it statistically that uh, the substitution is, uh, uh, is uh, more dominant than the promotion. So I'll sum up with our uh, what we have learned from this, uh, this operation. First of all, we find it important to establish an overall digital strategy. 
uh, which we did in 2004, saying we will do this, we will digitize the whole collection and we will establish a digital library. Secondly, we started by restructuring our resources to, to free money to, to get started. We didn't ask for extra money in the start, but we proved that we was able to do it, and then we have had additional financing coming in afterwards. And that has also been a very important foundation with the cooperation with the newspapers and the broadcasters, because they knew we are serious in this business and they knew we have the competence in this area. So this is important to establish uh, the expertise and technical capacity, both in the uh, terms of uh, digitization and in the question of long-term digital preservation. And then we have to build com confidence with the right shoulders and publishers through strategic partnerships. This is very important. Uh, we have met a, quite a lot of reluctance among the publishers, of course but not uh, what I would say was hostility. So, and this develops over the time to a more positive atmosphere of both negotiations and they know we have uh, respect for the, the, the legal rights and won't infringe those rights. And lastly, it's important to be flexible. So we combine bilateral agreements and collective licensing. The books, we have a, collecting agreement, a collective agreement which uh, was the only possible way to have this. With the newspapers, we could have chosen the same path, but we didn't. We chose another path, uh, uh, making arrangement with all the different uh, uh, publishing houses, which were interesting in, interested in being part of it and also was able to put money into it. So, this is our experience. Thank you.